Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Pottstown. Good to be with everybody this morning on this special Mother's Day morning. Uh, are there any announcements that anybody needs to make, wants to make? That, uh, Kay, <laughs> unmute yourself. Um, this Saturday, next Saturday, the 15th, we're having our work party and uh, it's been changed a few times. So I just want people to know, I'll be sending out an email, but uh, this time I was hoping that um, since we can never get everything done in one shot, it seems, I thought maybe we could have two to beautify our grounds. Uh, so on the 15th and then maybe another one in June on a Saturday. So, um, you know, hoping we have a good turnout and lunch is provided. Thanks. And I have an announcement. Yes, this Miranda. Wednesday, thank you. This Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. there will be a membership meeting. And um, if I send out invitations, um, you, can, you can probably go to the Google calendar and click to get into the meeting, but um, if I send invitations around variously, um, don't worry, no pressure, just thinking people might be interested in signing up. So welcome, join us. We're going to start planning. Uh, we've already started actually planning summer events, social events. So come if you want. Thank you. Good morning, Alan. Do you have any announcements for us? Apparently not. So we will move on. This is the mission of our faith, to practice hospitality, to honor the courageous heart, to inspire the generous soul, and to witness with all and to all the love that knows no bounds. Together with Unitarian Universalist congregations across the nation, we light our chalice flame this morning. Mary is about to do. It somehow be visible to those without our various walls. We would gladly share this Unitarian Universalist flame with them and brighten their lives and illuminate their souls as it has for those within our various walls. And I can see the flame. Thank you. And now our opening hymn is number 39, if you happen to have a hymnal. Bring, O Morn, thy music. The tune is Nicaea. If you want to sing along, fine, especially if you are muted. Carly, up to you. Thank you. At this time in our service, we join with many other Unitarian Universalist congregations in sharing what is in our hearts and on our minds. There is an event in your life which moves you this morning to joy or sorrow, to hope or gratitude. Please, please unmute yourself and share a few words. And as you are probably aware, today is Mother's Day. If you would like to say a few words about your mother or someone who has been a mother to you or someone who is an important mother in your life, words of love, words of justice, words of pain, now is the time. And Sherry will drop a stone into the bowl of water to symbolize 
with, with the ripples and the noise of the stone, that what affects one of us affects us all. Now is the time to share. Unmute yourself to share. Rick. Okay, we have a few joys this morning. Uh, number one, it was Erica's birthday this week. Um, all of our kids are back from college. So we, we have a, a full house again. So that's always nice. And we got to see um, Erica's parents uh, this weekend for pretty much the first time since COVID hit. So now that we're, you know, 80% vaccinated in the house, we figured it was safe to, uh, to get together. So that was very nice. Hi, it's Lisa, and did I do the right thing? Did I get it unmuted, and can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I just wanted to say that my mother taught me a very accepting and understanding perspective on people, and she said people always try to do their best. And so I, I try to, to give people the benefit of every doubt in, in just trying to think about how they're approaching what they're doing. Lisa, it's good to see you. It's been a while. Glad you could be with us. Thank you. With the circumstances just allowed me to get home sooner from the church where I work, and I do not need to go into work this afternoon. Um, they changed my hours because our duties were changed because the institution is opening up a little bit. And so I don't need to serve meals anymore and <laughs> taking meals to uh, people's rooms. So it, it's, um, I do my normal activities now, it's later time to start. Thank you. I would like to express gratitude for a second mother. Um, her name was Kathleen Mary Anderson and she was our neighbor in Middleborough, Massachusetts. She was an ornithologist and she also had a very respectable personal library and I will be forever grateful that she opened it up to me and said I could read any book in the library. Mm -hmm. Let us remember to hold in our hearts the joys and sorrows of the whole company of humanity, whether they are spoken and shared or silent and solitary. May we hold these ever in our hearts. Amen. Let us join in the spirit of prayer, meditation, or contemplation, after which Carly will play hymn number 13, Songs of Spirit. Feel free to sing along as long as you're muted. Spirit of life, interdependent web of all existence, God of many names and of none, mystery beyond mysteries. Help us to remember that all who dwell on this planet are our brothers and sisters, our siblings, that all creatures great and small with whom we share this planet are our cousins. That we all have mothers, that some of us are our mothers or will be mothers, that our time here is but an instant, the eternity that surrounds us. Strange is our situation here upon earth. We come for a short visit, each of us. We don't know why. Sometimes we feel there must be a purpose, perhaps even a divine purpose, but we're not sure what that would look like. Let's set aside the unknowable and the mysterious and acknowledge or declare that we are here for something beyond ourselves, something larger, something more lasting. We are mindful as we sit before our screens that we are hosts in this congregation, hosts to the next person to come through the Zoom door, hosts to those who will enter our social, our sacred space next year and the year after, in many years after we are gone and forgotten. But at the same time, let us be equally mindful that simultaneously we are guests. We are the guests of those who made this religious community possible. We are guests of those at the creation of Unitarianism and Universalism and of Unitarian Universalism, and of those who sustained our faith over many generations, for the guests of those who created and preserved this nation. And in a larger sense, we are the guests of creation, visitors here for a few short decades. May we be generous hosts and appreciative guests. 
Let us pause in silent contemplation. Let us pause to listen. What? We're not sure. Amen. Charlie? The first reading is a passage from the Reverend Re Reggie McNeil's 2015 book, Kingdom Come, Why We Must Give Up Our Obsession with Fixing the Church and What We Should Do Instead. Here's what he writes. I vividly remember the moment when the shift began. It was like the crackling of ice on a pond in the springtime that signaled the eventual collapse of the theological and philosophical platform that had supported my entire ministry to that point. After speaking one day about the future of the church to a group of church leaders in another part of the state, I got into my car and drove home. Late that night, I pulled into the parking lot of our apartment complex. I shut off the engine and began contemplating the 32 step climb to my third floor apartment. In the next few minutes before I even got out of the car, I had an unexpected but life-altering thought. It was more of a confession than an insight. I had just spent the past 10 years of my life building the perfect church, and not a single person in this apartment complex would walk across the street to attend it. It was the truth. I noticed that my family and I were the only ones leaving our apartment community on Sunday morning, all dressed up and headed to church. Everyone else was sleeping in, enjoying the pool, or heading to the lake or the mall. The church was nowhere on their list of possible things to do. What's wrong with this picture? If the church represents the manifest presence of God in the world, why was the culture losing interest in it? And why was so much church activity resulting in so little impact? Over time, I've come to believe that the church, particularly in North America, suffers from missional amnesia. And the church decided that the mission was about the growing church, about growing the church, doing church better, or even fixing the church. It went off mission. It became misguided, even idolatrous. <coughs> the next reading is from Mark Oppenheimer's beliefs column in the New York Times. When some turn to church, others go to prostitutes. Ali Huberly, a 27-year-old education consultant in Boston, awakens at 4.45 every morning to go to her CrossFit box or gym, where she spends two hours. When she and her boyfriend, whom she met through CrossFit, went apartment hunting, they chose a neighborhood near their box. A, pro, 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 a for-profit gym franchise founded in 2000 that now has 13,000 licensed operators serving at least 2 million exercisers. CrossFit, like television, sports fandom, and health fads. CrossFit has become the focus of study by researchers trying to pinpoint what constitutes religiosity in America. After all, it's surprisingly hard to say what makes a religion. Ms. Huberly speaks about her box, as others might speak about a church or synagogue community. The same is true for some 12-step program members and devoted college football fans. And in, in an increasingly secular America, all sorts of activities and subcultures provide the meaning that in the past, at least as we imagine it, religious communities did. Any criterion you choose to define religion will quickly reveal its shortcomings. Is it about belief in a deity? 
Judaism and Christianity have that, but many varieties of Buddhism do not. Existence after death, Mormons believe in it, but plenty of liberal Protestants do not. Yet consider football. Scholars of religion have noted it brings people together in large crowds to, quote, worship, and has a weekly holy day and even an annual holiday, the Super Bowl. Scholars have argued that activities as diverse as Star Trek fandom, dieting fans, and football would all constitute religions. But if anything that creates community and engenders passionate devotion can constitute religion, does the word lose all meaning? If everything is religion, then maybe nothing is. For one scholar, the, the key criterion is whether a given activity establishes a worldview. To what extent is the worldview of the crossfitters determined by their practices, their aspirations for the perfect body, for the most fit male or female in the world? Does their aspiration for fitness shape their view of how their world is ordered and organized? Skeptics might scoff that CrossFit is just a gym, but for many participants, it is obvious and much more. Ms. Huberly described the CrossFit experience as an intimate, supportive one in which cheering for one another to meet fitness goals was expected. It is a culture that can produce effects more often associated with church. There's something raw and vulnerable that happens to you when you go into the CrossFit gym. Ms. Huberly said, the workout can bring you to your knees, so to speak. Now, Carly, please, please play 1031 filled with loving kindness. Thank you. What is religion and why bother? That's the title, perhaps confusing, perhaps presumptuous title that I attached to this morning's message. It's Mother's Day today, and some of you were expecting a sermon about mothers and motherhood. That's not the plan, but I'll share with you a very quick story about my mother. <laughs> I was a young adult, single, living in Washington on a visit to my mother in Michigan. Out of the blue, she asked me, do you believe in God? Caught completely off guard, I couldn't even think to ask her for, for her definition of God, but simply answered, no. I'm sure she was disappointed. But the conversation ended there. I hope she would be proud of me now. I'm not a Presbyterian minister, but at least religion is in my life. My title poses two questions. First, what is religion? I'm not going to answer that. I don't think I know the answer. Maybe the answer is easy and obvious. The second question is, why bother? Why bother with what, you may ask. I'm not sure. It could mean, why bother trying to answer the question, what is religion? That's a good question. Or it could mean, why bother with religion? That's another good question. It would be tempting to put my lawyer's hat back on. The First minute Amendment to the Constitution proclaims freedom of religion and prohibits the establishment of a state religion and it leads to all kinds of difficult questions. It's easier to write law school examination questions than to answer them. Religious groups have tax exempt status. So is Scientology a religion? Why should we care? States generally have rules about who can officiate at weddings recognized by the state, usually authorizing among others members of the clergy. If you look at the weddings reported in the Sunday New York Times each week, they always identify the officiant. Quite often that person is a universal life minister, or more specifically, someone, quote, who became a universal life minister for the, the event. 
So those of us who earned a 90 credit master's degree completed a summer of clinical pastor education and years internship and survived an oral examination have to compete for business with a mail order minister. What sense does that make? But no, I'm not wearing my lawyer's hat today. The word religion comes from the Latin religio, which refers among other things to the bond between us humans and the gods, which probably comes from the Latin verb religare, which means to bind back. Does the Bible tell us what religion is? The Hebrew Bible, that is the Old Testament, never once in the translations I checked, never once uses the word religion. In the New Testament, there aren't more than a handful of instances of the word religion, and none at all in the four Gospels or in the authentic letters of Paul. The Greek word translated as religion is threskeia, which in Greece, a few hundred years before the New Testament writers, meant fear of the gods or attention to proper ritual. An interesting exercise for you to do when you have nothing better to do, and I suspect that you will always have something better to do, is to compare and contrast the following words, faith, holiness, magic, piety, religion, religiosity, reverence, sacred, spirituality, superstition, and worship. And I've listed those listed in an alphabetical order. My topic today was inspired by a book by the Columbia University philosophy professor, Philip Kitcher, Life After Faith, The Case for Secular Humanism. Looks like that. The title summarizes the book quite well. He argues that what is left of religion, after we leave out the incredible parts, can be provided secularly. Fitcher, by the way, like me, studied philosophy at Princeton, but he got a PhD. I did not. Religions, Kitcher explains, are distinguished by their invocation of something beyond the mundane physical world, some transcendent realm. What he has in mind in particular is God or some divine entity and some sort of survival after death. He concludes that the processes that generate specific beliefs about the transcendent, or we might say the supernatural, are so unreliable that all of the conflicting specific religious doctrines are almost certainly false. Thus, no God, at least of the traditional sort, no heaven or hell, at least of the literal survival after death sort. The other half of religion is ethics, morality, how we should live. In religion, ethical rules come from God. Ethical authority is, in, is God's authority. Kitcher here takes us back to Plato and Socrates. If goodness is what the deity wills, Kitcher writes, does the goodness arise from the divine willing, or does the willing respond to the goodness? In the first case, the source of goodness is an arbitrary fiat. In the second case, there is a source of goodness prior to and independent of the deity's will. Why would we accept an arbitrary fiat? I can't think of any reason. One might argue that God is perfectly good and thus that what God wills has to be good. But why, would, why should we accept the idea that God is perfectly good? Take a look at the Bible. No perfectly good God there. Now one might respond that to the extent that the God of the Bible is less than perfectly good, it is because the human authors of the various books of the Bible have not accurately understood God. But then the question becomes, how does God communicate to us humans? And how do we tell what is truly from God and what is less than a divine source? So recall that someone claiming to be God instructed Abraham to kill, to murder his son Isaac. How is Abraham to determine whether that voice he heard was really God's? It looks to me like we should look not to God, but to some other source for our ethical rules. Are we left with nothing more than subjective attitudes? Does thou shalt not kill come down to killing? Ugh. Kitcher's answer lies in the evolution of human civilization. Our morality has developed over the centuries. There's much that humanity, the overwhelming majority of us, agrees upon. There are, of course, areas where different views are possible. And we should not presume that we will ever reach a complete and permanent ethical code. Questions about the transcendent or the supernatural, questions of ethics overlap when our subject is the afterlife, 
in particular, the problem of eternal punishment for human failings. How could finite lives, Kitcher asks, no matter how blotted by appalling crimes, how could finite lives ever deserve eternal torment? Our ordinary standards of justice condemn such disproportionate transcendent retribution. While Kitcher would dispense with religion that is characterized by unsupportable factual claims and a fallacious approach to ethics, he leaves room for what he calls, quote, refined religion. With refined religion, practices and commitments are more important than doctrines about the transcendent. Doctrinal statements are understood symbolically or metaphorically, and commitment is made to values more than to doctrinal statements. Doesn't this sound to you like Unitarian Universalism? It does to me. Indeed, Kit Kitcher mentions Unitarians as an example of refined religion. While he prefers refined religion to unrefined religion, his actual preference is to move beyond religion altogether. Here, I would part company with him. A year and a half ago, pre-pandemic, prior to Christmas, I was part of the chorus for two performances of Handel's Messiah. More than 200 of us were crowded into risers in the chancel of the Wayne Presbyterian Church. I was in the middle of the next to the last row, the strong bass voices coming from behind me, with organ pipes on my left and on my right, letting out all the stops and final amen, with an orchestra in front that made the conductor seem like he was half a football field away. Thought we had a full house on Saturday, but apparently Sunday's crowd was even larger. A beautiful stained glass window at the back of the center was straight ahead of me. When the bass soloist sang, the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. The trumpet did sound. And if the dead could be raised, that pair, the bass and the trumpeter, they could have done it. Earlier, the soprano soloist sang of the shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Those shepherds had no idea that they were about to receive a visit from the angel of the Lord. Why did the angel visit the shepherds, you might ask? Why didn't the angel visit the high priest or the king? The shepherds were at the bottom of the social hierarchy. That was the point. Jesus was coming to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the, the, the Lord's favor, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We in the chorus, a multitude of the heavenly host, you might say, then sang out for peace on earth, goodwill toward men and, and women and children too, I'm sure it was intended. The hundreds of us filling that room, we had religion, we did religion. Could this have been done, this experience have been equaled in an entirely secular setting? Perhaps, I have my doubts. Could this have been done in a Unitarian Universalist church with a 200 member choir as the ministry of the church, with a powerful pipe organ? In theory, yes. In practice, I can to see it. Did my Messiah experience of the weekend draw me back to my Presbyterian roots? No, for me, there's no going back. Religion, and I'm thinking here of Christianity in particular, religion has traditionally given people hope that all will turn out well eventually. Either we can rely on God to guide humanity, to guide humanity in a safe direction, or at least there will be that pie in the sky by and by, for most of us anyway. Secular humanists, however, are rational, cannot have the same confidence. Can we Unitarian Universalists? The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. We've been told that many times. I think it's true. Given enough time, humanity will get it right and will create the kingdom of God here on earth. We'll have our city on the hill. We'll have the, the realm of peace, justice, and sustainability. But note that I said, given enough time. Do we have enough time? 58 years ago, we came close to blowing ourselves up in a nuclear conflagration sparked by the Cuban Missile Crisis. Today, the climate crisis threatens our future. Will we respond in time? Will our response be adequate? The future is not determined. 
this could go either way. And events in Arizona and elsewhere tell us democracy is threatened as never before in our lifetimes. We all want to have meaningful lives, don't we? As you use, we're in favor of a free and responsible search for meaning. But what makes a life meaningful? What has a better chance of achieving a meaningful, meaningful life? A traditional believer, a person of refined religious belief, such as one of us, or a secular humanist? If I knew the secret to achieving the meaningful life, I would certainly share it with you. Or perhaps I would save it for a best-selling book and make a fortune. One candidate for a meaningful life is a life that goes on forever. A normal span of life here, then life eternal up there. But if one's three score and 10 aren't meaningful, will another 70 years help or another 70 after that? I don't see how. On the other hand, if one's three score and 10 are meaningful, wouldn't continuation ad aeternitatum eventually draining the meaningfulness out of life? Another candidate for meaningful life is a life that fulfills God's purpose for one's life. But how do I determine what's God, what God's purpose for my life is? And haven't we been told that God gave us the freedom and the responsibility to find our own path in life? If I were to conclude that my life has been meaningful, is that conclusion subject to review? Can our own judgment about this be infallible? Shouldn't think so. Is the meaningful life question a yes or no question? Can we have a percentage score? If, if you die young, do you get an incomplete? Pitcher concludes that lives matter when they touch others. People's autonomous choices are framed always. The meaning of our lives are individual creations, products of people's autonomous choices, but framed always by the core ethical ideal of other directedness. But all this makes me wonder how many people you use or not actually search for meaning. I don't think I do. I'm too busy doing other things. From time to time, I search for the right hymn to include in that week's service, for last Sunday's New York Times book review, or for this Sunday's New York Times, which I hope will be waiting in the driveway by the time we're done here. I search for unsalted sunflower seeds, but I can't remember the last time I searched for meaning. So my advice is don't search for meaning, but strive to bless the world. There are many ways to do that. That would be the topic for another day. One's religion should provide a foundation, a guide, a refuge in this project. For me, Unitarian Universalism does, does that. A few minutes ago, we sang, or we would have sung, May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be whole. Let's look at the last of those prayers. May I be whole. Wholeness, integrity. Having a life of wholeness, having a life of integrity, of authenticity. These ideas should give us guidance as we follow the path of life. We should seek to avoid having a divided self, where we're a different person in different situations different people. Our religion should support us in this effort. Our religion should call us to task, should urge us to repent, think again, when we stray from the norm of wholeness. As Parker Palmer reminds us, we cannot embrace the challenge of wholeness all alone. We need trustworthy relationships, tenacious communities of support, if we, if we are to sustain the journey toward an undivided life. And that's, that's here. The hidden wholeness, the journey toward an undivided life. I trust that this is what you can provide here. Trustworthy relationships in a tenacious community of support. You've probably heard the slogan that the purpose of religion is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. If you have to explain religion in eight words or less, can you come up with something better? Now, you could do both of these things, the comforting and the afflicting, with the promise of heaven and the threat of hell. But I think it would be more helpful, more intellectually rigorous and honest, to keep the comforting and the afflicting here at home, in this world, not the next. How do we comfort the afflicted? 
Depends, of course, on the situation. Be present. Show that you care. Give them your love. Let them know that they're not forgotten. Listen to them. Pray with them. Don't make false promises. Don't try to come up with your, don't try to one-up them with your story of affliction. If possible, try to mitigate the affliction. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan. We're not told about what he said to the victimized traveler. We told about what he did to that unfortunate person. And what one might do is, is do to help can range from calling 911 for the person in distress to lobbying for a higher minimum wage or investment in renewal, renewal energy. Why would we want to afflict the comfortable? If you're comfortable, you haven't been paying attention to what's going on around us. The pain that others feel doesn't bother you. Our religion, our Unitarian Universalist religion, can provide a foundation, a vantage point, for addressing, for confronting the problems that afflict our nation and our world. Problems that directly affect some people more than others, but problems from which none of us can escape. We can provide hope Someday, today's problems will be in our history, in our past, and that our descendants will live in a land flowing with milk and honey, with swords beaten into plowshares and spears, spears into pruning hooks. It can remind us that no God will solve our problems for us, but that it is up to us to save our dear planet Earth and all its inhabitants. Some, to sum up these various thoughts this morning, let me suggest that as long as we humans have religion, we need to have a liberal, refined version of religion. And as long as theological or socially conservative religion thrives in our nation, we especially need to have a liberal, refined version of religion. That liberal, refined version of religion, for me, is Unitarian Universalism. I think we'll need it for a very long time. Amen. Now, Carly, our closing hymn is 322, Thanks Be For These. And if you have the words or know the words, let us read together our words for extinguishing the chalice. Extinguish this flame, but not the gift of wisdom, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and in our hands until we are together again. After the benediction, please get yourself another cup of coffee and return for discussion during coffee hour. May the, thrive, may the striving for wholeness bless us, that we may bless the world. May the power of love sustain us, giving meaning to our lives. May the peace of this community preserve our going out and our coming in, from this time forth until we meet again. Amen. <laughs>